Hi everyone. First of all, welcome. Good to see you all again. I see some familiar faces. Thank you for making it today, despite the rain and some stressful news about the strikes and all, you know, Munich things. Anyway, yeah, today we have two wonderful speakers, one of them from Gene AI, and we have second, a PhD researcher from LMO to explain his latest research in the realm of NLP, the hot topic, instruction fine tuning and all. So yeah, we've, I want to start with thanking today's host, JetBrains. Uh, yeah, you, I think all of you know about JetBrains, but I want to mention the fact that they also have an open day, uh, 22nd of June. Yeah, it's a more like developer related event and it's like uh, JetBrain 9. So if you're interested, you can also come to that event. This event will also be recorded. The slides will be provided after the event. And yeah, without further ado, I want to welcome first speaker. Thank you very much. Have a nice one. Can everyone hear me? Good. Because the organizer told me that this light is going to turn green. Uh, and I have color blindness, so that doesn't help me so much <laughs> if it's red or green. But I'm glad to know that you can hear me now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, uh, JetBrains, for organizing this event, hosting us here. Uh, Mutasham and Philip. I don't know if I've met Philip uh, or if I see him here. Is Philip here? No. <laughs> but thanks, Mutasham and Philip, for inviting me as well. My name is Sahil. Uh, I work as a senior product manager for Gina AI. Uh, and uh, what is Gina AI? Just in one word, we are a commercial open source software company, a three-year-old commercial open source software company. Uh, and today, what I want to talk about is essentially the open source stuff. Yeah, uh, what I want to emphasize in today's talk is how we can move beyond the machine learning and deep learning hype to do actually something useful with the machine learning and deep learning hype, right? And I hope uh, you uh, enjoy this talk at least as much as I had uh, fun making it. So please sit back. Gina AI is a ML ops platform for multimodal applications, right? Uh, let me first start with multimodal. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know what multimodal is, but essentially it's a, uh, it's a mode of providing input to machine learning systems that is not just one modality. What is modality? It could be either text as a modality, image as a modality, videos as a modality. And a multimodal application is essentially a system which doesn't discriminate between what modality of the input uh, the user gives them, but essentially is able to deal with all of these modalities that are listed, or hopefully at least most of it, right? I'm also being actually a little bit dishonest when I say that Gina AI is a completely multimodal company, because if you would look at the ratio of what kind of modalities most of our users uh, put into the system, I would say it's at least 70% text with 25% uh, images and maybe 5% the rest of it, right? But essentially, the platform is a multimodal platform, uh, an ML ops platform for multimodal. What that means is uh, Gina AI's platform allows you to put machine learning models just from models into something that you can actually make working at scale. Um, our um, uh, The way we form the paradigm of ML ops is in two spaces. We say that you, all of your applications are either devoted to looking for information, so you're either searching for information in a big bank of information somewhere, or if this information doesn't exist, then you're trying to create it, right? So that's the creative or the generative part of AI. And the uh, first part, which essentially, again, if I was to break it down into ratios, it's it's the majority part is about searching for information. So search what exists, uh, create what uh, doesn't exist. Why am I here today? Uh, I want to talk about putting AI models into production. And I want to share with you uh, a few of our experiences, a few of the problems that we've seen uh, in industrial adoption that we can distill down into like three or four points. Uh, and these are as follows. Essentially, because of how lucrative, how attractive the demos on Twitter are, uh, it, makes it, uh, it makes it almost inevitable that Decision makers at companies are going to try to use whatever's on Twitter and make it work in production. 
And this, in our experience, almost never works in a month or so, right? This takes much more effort. So mainly the problem here is that of misaligned uh, expectations. Uh, and even more than expectations, this uh, even more than the uh, AI landscape itself, these expectations come from particular models or one or the other model, which are always uh, put out there as increasing performance over some model that was there one week ago, right? And these misaligned expectations actually end up costing companies a lot of money in the long run because they've simply put a lot of very expensive resources into trying to make something work, which was simply not built for purpose. Uh, or doesn't take care of all the stuff that needs to go around this one model to actually make it uh, productive. Now, uh, all of this you can think of at uh, think of as a purely software engineering problem in some sense because all the problem that I'm talking about about scaling models, about putting it into production, about making it usable for a business use case, uh, these didn't just come into existence uh, when ChatGPT came into existence. These problems have been in existence since software came into existence. So in that sense, actually, all of these problems can be aligned and you can think of them as problems that are essentially software engineering problems. Uh, just that these pieces of software, weights of deep learning models, they are so disproportionately big, they're insanely big and they sit at the periphery of the entire other software system that is actually supposed to make your business use case work, right? So this creates a little bit of imbalance in actually where the problem is coming from, which is somewhere at the end of your software pipeline altogether and where actually the business value comes from, right? Where you actually end up making optimizations, making it productive, making it scalable, right? And uh, in, in my opinion, basically, uh, all of the knowledge of DevOps and proper software architecture, this often tends to go into the bin when you're working on machine learning systems, but they, you do tend to miss it when you actually have to put them into production, right? And that's the point that I try to uh, drive home today in today's talk with Gina AI and with our open source uh, ecosystem, uh, we provide a comprehensive framework to uh, simplify scaling, to simplify deployment, and to simplify basically putting these machine learning models into uh, production. Uh, before I go into a use case and kind of show you how you can uh, scale and deploy using Gene AI, uh, I want to basically make sure that we don't go back from this talk thinking that actually we shouldn't do machine learning research at all. Right, uh, And that's what this slide is for. In fact, all the research that goes into making semantic search engines, for example, uh, is, is really important and the market in fact needs it. So please, if you're working on deep learning research, trying to create better semantic search engines, trying to create better models for generating more accurate embeddings, longer embeddings, please keep working on it. Because as you see from these numbers, a lot of users still think that they do too many clicks to actually find the information that they're looking for on the internet. If this wasn't the case, why would we be talking about ChatGPT potentially replacing Google at all, right? If the number of clicks to get to the information that you want was not important. Also, 70% of search engines, according to these two sources that are down there, are unable to return uh, correct results for e even simple synonyms of certain product names, right? And if you've worked in search for any amount of time, you know that this is true, right? Uh, and then my last point is that 34% of search engines uh, don't even return any relevant results if you misspell a word by just one character. If you think about how many search engines do you encounter on the internet every single day, uh, this uh, actually is a very big problem, right? So it's, it's absolutely important that we try to keep making semantic search. Uh, we try to keep making deep learning models more and more accurate based on the use cases that we're looking at today. Having said that, how do we do this in production? So what I'm going to do today for the rest of this talk is to use an example uh, application and see how you would uh, how you would build this example application using uh, only GeneAI's open source uh, components. And this example is as follows. We want to build an art search engine, right? Now you can see actually with uh, these two examples of uh, traditional search and neural search, what the problems with an art search engine could be. If you type a query which contains the style of uh, the art that you're looking for or slash and the name of the painter that you're looking for, 
you with traditional search engines you're likely to get results which have either the style of the painting or the name of the painter somewhere in the metadata which hopefully you've indexed uh, who knows if you have right if you've indexed that metadata you're you're able to find these results uh, but not if you actually don't have this information in the metadata at all right this is what we try to solve with a neural search engine what is neural search engine it tries to understand the meaning and context of your queries and also the meaning and context of the data set that you're searching through such that you don't have to encode in your metadata the fact that paul klee's paintings should potentially belong in the same bucket as Edward Munch's painting uh, without putting it into metadata, right? And that's what we're trying to do with a neural search engine. How will we build this? In the next coming slides, we will first start with uh, looking at uh, GeneAI's first open source offering, which is Dockeray, uh, to see how you can load and store multimodal documents and uh, uh, make them ready for production, uh, make them ready for processing. Then we look at executors, which are essentially encapsulations of different steps along the way to making an application. We look at Gina flows, which would orchestrate these instructions, these uh, small steps along the way uh, in a cloud native way. And finally, we're going to see how you're going to deploy this either on Gina AI cloud or any uh, cloud provider of your choice. Before I go into Docker, uh, a few primers for uh, those who uh, might be new to the field of semantic search. Uh, I want to start with approximate nearest neighbors really quickly. What is approximate nearest neighbors? It sits right at the center of semantic search. Uh, this is the algorithm uh, which actually is able to figure out if two things mean the same thing without you actually having to tell the system that they mean the same thing, right? And how does this work? Uh, it's based on KNN essentially. Uh, and uh, how this works is that you would represent your input data in whatever modality your input data is in the form of vectors using any deep learning model of your choice. Uh, and you would do uh, or you would apply basically a distance metric on this vector representation. And based on the distance between your query representation and the representation of all the data sets that you've indexed also with the embeddings, you can find which documents are closest to the query that the user has given. Now, if you think about this problem, uh, first of all, uh, it should be clear that traditional search engines would not be able to do this at least that easily without having to load all the data into memory first. And the reason for that is traditional search engines are symbolic search engines. They lay stress on which symbols are present in your documents, which words are present in your documents, not what the representation of these words are in a vector format. Right. So if you were actually to implement uh, this algorithm uh, in uh, by storing your documents in a list, you can imagine that the complexity of going through all the documents uh, would be uh, of order n. Uh, and also, if the vector representation itself grows in dimensions, then you have more of a problem. Right. This would take linearly more time as the vector representation also grows. How do we solve this? So ANN solves this by uh, using multiple algorithms. The one that is most common across several vector search engines is uh, HNSW. Essentially, the idea is that you progressively represent your entire data set as smaller and smaller worlds. And uh, each of these worlds is nothing but think of this as a center point of a neighborhood in a graph. Right. So uh, how this would work is if you're at layer three, when you start your search, you have to find the neighborhood that is closest to your query. And then you would progressively go down the levels in the hierarchy to actually find the data point that is indexed in layer one. So layer one is your actual data, actual documents that you've indexed. And layer three is some level of representation on it. Right. Of course, uh, this already makes it clear why this is called an approximate neighborhood search and not an exact neighborhood search, because what if your centroids are not calculated correctly? Right? What if two centroids are close enough to each other that you actually end up picking only one? But in most cases, these are reasonably uh, well-performing algorithms. Uh, and uh, more, uh, more than anything else, uh, the fact that they take much less computation complexity uh, is more important than finding exact matches. All right, so with this out of the way, how would you create a semantic search engine with Gene AI? First, let's start with Docker. What is Docker? It's nothing but pedantic for machine learning applications, right? If you have developed any applications uh, in TensorFlow and PyTorch, even Onyx, you know that the Python interfaces to these uh, to these um, libraries is not 
first of all, entirely even Pythonic in a lot of cases. And it's definitely not typed, which would be considered good, right? So there's a lot of drawbacks with the existing uh, machine learning uh, libraries that are out there as even when you consider only a Python as a language. And Dockery is a way to basically encapsulate multimodal documents in a way that you can transport these documents throughout your value chain of machine learning applications without making any, uh, any, any transformations inside the Docker. Right? So um, it has a lot of uh, additional attributes on top of TensorFlow, PyTorch, as well as fast API or Pydantic. For example, Pydantic wouldn't give you something that Docker A gives you natively, which is storage of embeddings inside the class without expressly uh, writing them down in the definition. If you create a data class uh, derived from uh, Gina's Docker A, each of the fields that you uh, would add to this document, title, attribution, thumbnail, all of these would automatically come with an embedding field. So you can use any embedding algorithm of your choice and these embeddings would be stored efficiently inside uh, the data class itself. All right, so you don't have to specify it like you would have to do with Pydantic. Plus, if you were using Pydantic, and you were exposing, let's say, a web service uh, for your application, you would then have to remove these, uh, these uh, extra fields which would not be relevant for your end user. And this is also something that you don't have to do with, uh, uh, with Docker A because Docker A also is natively compatible with fast, type, fast API. So it has a Pydantic-like interface. You can do all kinds of data validation directly on Docker A without removing or uh, without adding extra checks for fields that your users are not interested in. So in this case, what we've done is we've created a data class called art piece. It has a title, it has an attribution who created that art piece uh, and a thumbnail of an image. Text and images are both fields uh, uh, from Docker A. Uh, images are loaded whenever you upload the Docker A to your S3 storage or GNI Cloud storage, they're automatically extracted as tensors. You don't have to load them uh, with a separate command, right? Um, and then what we've done here is we've created what is called a document array, which is a list of documents, all of type art piece. Uh, what all that we've done is give the thumbnail URL uh, to the uh, thumbnail field and these URLs will be loaded automatically uh, when this program is run and loaded in memory. Okay, so you have created your Docker A where you would load all the images or all your art pieces that you're interested in indexing. What is the next step? Next step is that you will uh, try to basically index it essentially in any vector search engine. And for this, uh, we have Gina executors. The idea of executors is very simple. It's simply an encapsulation in a very modular way. One step that you would do with the data along the entire pre-processing, processing and indexing pipeline. So these are the two, uh, these are two examples of what you can do with uh, executors. You would first uh, probably want to embed uh, each document and you would do that. In this case, we've used the ResNet model for uh, embedding uh, our, um, our vision fields or so image fields, but you can use a clip model, you can use a blip model. Uh, if you want to use multimodal, then you can uh, use one of these models, or you can even use uh, an API either from Replicate or from Gina or from Hugging Face that would simply return the embeddings for you. And this you would encapsulate uh, in an executor called Embedder. You see that the uh, the uh, Docker array called Docs has a native method called embed because we know that embedding is one of the primary machine learning tasks that almost all machine learning applications would have to do in one or the other way. So we have an embed uh, task there and the model that you give to embed task can be either a TensorFlow model, a PyTorch model, uh, an Onyx model or uh, one of uh, the preloaded models, for example, from Hugging Face, right? All of these interfaces are supported natively by Docker array. And then what you would like to do, uh, by the way, sorry, uh, you also see this decorator called requests here. This simply means that the executor embedder can be exposed directly as a service. Just like fast API, you will get a gRPC or an HTTPS endpoint for it, right? The other executor that we have here is an indexer. Uh, and what it does is takes a Docker as input uh, and uh, simply stores it in an Elasticsearch index. 
Of course, this assumes that you're using the uh, using uh, Elasticsearch version greater than eight because otherwise you wouldn't be able to store embeddings in there. But instead of Elasticsearch, you can use any other search storage backends that are supported by uh, Docker. We support Elasticsearch, VV8, Quadrant, Postgres, uh, ANN Lite. I think recently we also started supporting Chroma. Uh, so you can use any of those uh, backends instead of Elasticsearch if you're interested in using them, right? And what we do is simply load this Docker add the new documents coming in, uh, and these are automatically indexed also in Elastic. The next step to this would be chaining these executors together in a form of directed acyclic graph. Uh, this is something that you would be familiar with if uh, you're coming from the Kubernetes world, that you can use something like a Argo workflow uh, to uh, link uh, different containers together in a flow, and the concept is pretty similar here. You define a flow where you tell what the entry point to uh, your program is. In our case, it would be the indexer, and I'll just tell you why that is the case. Uh, and you list your executors in the order that they should be activated, uh, passing around Docker arrays between each other. And the great thing about flows uh, is that you can define them in a way that is very similar to defining a Kubernetes uh, configuration. You can also say for each of the executors what kind of resources you want to give them. Uh, if uh, these executors have commands that should be run on the GPU, you can specify that uh, with the executors. You can specify the number of replicas that your gateway needs to have, uh, or you can just leave it to your cloud provider, uh, cloud service provider to scale it up and down as needed. Yeah, uh, now uh, I showed you on the last slide that we have the indexer and executor. How this flow works is that indexer will take a Docker array that the user gives it, put, put it into uh, Elasticsearch, and embedder would just take all of the Docker array uh, documents that indexer returns and just embeds them. When you run the docs.embed command, by the way, uh, these embeddings are also stored on the storage backend that comes with the DA. Right? So you don't have to store it again or think about actually what happens with these embeddings that are created using the embed function. They're all uh, automatically stored on the backend that you've chosen. Right? So that's why we first put the indexer there uh, as the entry point uh, and the embedder. Right? And once you've defined your flows, uh, all you need to do is uh, run Gina flow, uh, tell it which uh, YAML configuration to use, and you get a ready-made gRPC as well as an HTTP endpoint for it. So this doesn't give you the HTTP endpoint in the screenshot, but you can give it a uh, you can give it an additional command line option to get an HTTPS endpoint as well. Okay, now you have this flow. Uh, you've run this flow on your local machine. You've tried out whether the model that you were interested in using actually is doing what it's supposed to do. Everything looks fine. Now comes the question of actually putting it in production. You're, of course, not going to serve your models, your applications from your local system. You need to put it somewhere. Uh, how would you do this? You have two options for this. You can use GeneAI Cloud for this. And unfortunately, this is not the open source offering uh, like flows and executors. Uh, but it functions very similar to uh, what you might already be used to using either Azure or AWS for it. Uh, you would log into GeneAI Cloud, uh, use that token in your application, uh, and then deploy the flow uh, using that token directly uh, using your command line. Right? Uh, here I've shown you what comes out as output if you've deployed multiple flows uh, on your uh, system. You get a list of all of those flows uh, and the state, whether they're serving, whether they no longer exist, uh, or whether they're still uh, spinning up. Yeah? If you're not using GeneAI Cloud, of course, you can also use any other uh, uh, cloud service provider of your choice. All you have to do is run the Gina flow command uh, that you saw on the last slide as the entry point to your container, and you have everything that you need. Okay, uh, once you've deployed this flow, how would you run a search? Uh, this is also very simple. I haven't put in all the code for designing the executor for the search, but think of it as being very similar to the indexer flow, right? The nice thing with having uh, your operations encapsulated in executors is that you can reuse executors for different flows, right? In fact, you can also upload your executors to GNI, GNI Cloud and never have to write it again. Uh, how this works is that the search uh, uh, entry point can use the same executor uh, for embedding as the indexer entry point used. And then you run a dot find command inside your search executor to do uh, HNSW search that I just showed you a few slides ago and get the top ranked results, right? And the search endpoint, uh, you can just call using a normal uh, 
post request uh, or a gRPC request or even a GraphQL request if you're interested in using a GraphQL endpoint for this. Okay, so that was actually it. Uh, that's actually how you uh, bring a machine learning application from experimentation to production and scale it as you go along. Right? Uh, the entire ecosystem of Gina AI products looks something like this. Uh, we already talked about Docker A and Gina executors and Gina flow. Uh, Gina AI cloud, uh, where you can potentially upload your flows, is built on top of J cloud infrastructure. And J cloud is, uh, is, in very simple terms, nothing but a thin wrapper around uh, Kubernetes operators. Right? So you can j uh, just j deploy your own J cloud in your local systems if you're running on-prem or self-hosted in some way, uh, and then use the same commands that you would otherwise use for Gene AI cloud. Uh, this is the difference between other cloud service providers. You can't spin up your own, own AWS, unfortunately. Right? Uh, but you can do that with J cloud. Hub is the place where we store all the executors, like I just said. So if you have an executor that you want to privately host in a private hub, for example, inside your organizations, you want to share this executor, this processing step with other applications, you can just upload it on the hub and pull it pretty much like you would pull a Docker image in your application, right? In addition to these two, we also have a few consumer products, which are paid products, not open source products, but I have to quickly talk about them as well. We have an inference API, quite similar to Replicate, Hugging Face, uh, where we have curated state-of-the-art models, uh, which are offered at much more efficient prices, both in terms of QPS and actually price per API call than any other provider that is out there in the market, right? So we have image segmentation model there, we have uh, upscaling models there, embedding models for all kinds of modalities that you can think of. Uh, and soon we're also going to have text generation models there. We have a fine tuner service that is also a cloud-based service, but that is one thing that you can also host yourself because we have an open source offering for fine tuner as well. Essentially what fine tuner is, is that you pick one of the models from our catalog and then you can fine tune it on your own organization data, on your own private data, and also then host the model as you would like to. Right? So we provide the infrastructure needed for loading these weights uh, using uh, cloud uh, resources, and then you can just fine tune them using your own data. Then we have an end-to-end -end search solution, uh, a no-code solution for basically everything that we did so far. And GNI Cloud is a place where all of these are hosted together. Um, conclusion, yeah, we first looked at how you process data using Docker A, how you would uh, encapsulate functions that would actually make this application functional, how would you chain them together in a flow, uh, and which GNI ecosystem products can you use also alternatively to bring these things into production. Um, Gene AI was found in 2020 uh, a com uh, as a game beha uh, in Berlin. It still exists as a game beha parent entity in Berlin. We have three offices worldwide. Uh, Beijing is one of our offices and Shenzhen is our second biggest office after Berlin uh, where, uh, where our CTO uh, basically sits. Uh, our main headquarters are in Berlin, though. Uh, I work out of Munich, so if uh, all of you, or at least most of you, are coming out of Munich, please feel free to connect to me, uh, and I'll be very happy to talk to you about not only Gene AI, but anything else that is interesting to you. Uh, my email address is there. Uh, all the other contact links uh, for Gene AI, the bunch, the whole Jing Bang is there. Just look up and connect if you would like to. And now I'm done and open for questions. So let's go back to the two executors. So uh, there is an embedder which takes your Docker A and you saw that there was a text field, there were two text fields and two uh, and one image field and embeds it using a model, right? Now, once you have that embedding, this Docker A actually lives in memory. This lives in RAM, right? You need to persist it somehow. And that's what the indexer executor is for. You would put these uh, embedded documents into Elasticsearch or VV8, whichever to basically retrieve it later. Huh? Yeah, now I'm... More questions? Yes. So with this ecosystem and so on, uh, do you have a, a how much of a buying process this all time we have? Especially from Kubernetes. And uh, do you have a suspense for new products and which you can use? So basically everything that is until the consumer products is so free, you can use it.
because it's all open source, right? But we have had experience with uh, bigger enterprises who, or well, actually more than even bigger enterprises, SMEs, uh, who don't have in-house resources to, for example, train their own model, host their own, mo own model, because their expertise is building software, right? And that's what the consumer products are for. If you go to cloud.gina.ai, you will find a pricing section where you can find out how much each of them costs. Uh, but essentially, uh, our value proposition is that if you want to bring your machine learning models from either research or from experimentation to production, you would use the framework Gene AI. You could use the paid version, you could also not use it. But if you encapsulate all of your uh, execution pipelines in executors and flows, then you can deploy them and scale them as you need in the cloud. Right, But even more than that, if you don't even want to host your own models that you want to put in the cloud, you can use, for example, inference API to just use a REST API, uh, get embeddings back for images. You can just use a REST endpoint for captioning an image. right? And you can use this caption, put it in a normal symbolic search engine. You don't probably need a semantic search engine. Yeah. They also provide versioning and that capability. So that is already in available because no. I No, it's not actually. Oh, okay. I mean it's a it's a little bit of a gimmick, I want to say, <laughs> that we call it MLOps because for me also the value chain of MLOps starts from the data. And actually we come in only when you have either a model or want to use a model in place. So data versioning is not part of China's ecosystem. You would use something like DVC or something for this. Uh, Autocomplete, yes, uh, but did you mean not yet? But it's very easy to implement, actually. Right? You can get some, uh, you can expand the scope of your uh, top end results and kind of get, did you mean? What you can also do, actually, by combining these offerings is to uh, create plugins for your existing symbolic search engines, right? You don't have to only use a semantic search engine. You can get, let's say, top 100 results from a symbolic search engine and re-rank them based on a search. That's also possible because Docker works also in memory. So uh, to answer your question, this end-to-end -end search solution doesn't provide did you mean service, but it does provide an autocomplete feature. And uh, by the way, this also comes with a front end. Uh, so uh, if you want to just play around with the search app, you get like a streamlit front end. Uh, and once you're done experimenting, you just incorporate a gRPC endpoint into your application. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Have a nice day.